Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 25th edition of the Educational Leadership Forum panel discussion series focused on transforming education. Thank you for investing your time with us today. We sincerely appreciate your presence and participation as we delve into an important question. How can we better prepare learners to resolve conflicts? My name is Aryan Salman, and I'm the moderator for this panel discussion. Now, let's talk about something we all deal with conflicts. Yes, they are part of life, whether we like it or not, internal, personal, professional, interpersonal, you name it. Conflicts are like these unwelcome guests who just won't leave. But here's the thing, perhaps they're not all bad. In fact, they can be a catalyst for growth. And if we can hand handle them right, uh, they could also help us move in directions that we would have otherwise not explored. In this context, education plays a massive role um, in how we approach to conflict resolution skills, peace building, uh, and more. So imagine a world where we all have the superpower to resolve conflicts like professionals. That's the kind of uh, system we look, um, or the system in education um, that we aim for to prepare young people towards. So it's not just about teaching math or history, it's also about instilling this culture of peace and equipping learners with school skills that are crucial for them to thrive in life. And the impact of this goes beyond the individual. So as you equip learners with the tools to handle both their internal battles and the ones they face with others, uh, it could enable us to shape a brighter and more sustainable future. Uh, it could think about a situation where our learners are better equipped to communicate better, to understand different viewpoints better, and to keep their calm in heated moments. So these are some of the things that lay a groundwork, not just for individual flourishing, but also for so societal flourishing uh, by building empathy, compassion, mindfulness, critical inquiry, and understanding. It is in this context that we invite a stellar panel of global experts and education leaders to share their insights and uh, perspectives on how to better prepare learners to resolve conflicts. So I have with me today two amazing individuals, um, Vanessa Temple and Oluwasan Kolawole. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Oluwasan. Uh, so she is the founder of Peace Shapers, which collaborates with stakeholders to promote African student safety. She has organized Bridge to Peace Bootcamp in partnership with UN and ANI, equipping over 100 Nigerian young people with essential conflict resolution skills. So a very warm welcome to you. And I'm delighted to welcome Vanessa Temple. She is a UN global schools advocate working to bring sustainable development goals uh, to life for all stakeholders that she works with. Uh, she has developed projects with higher high school with organizations like UNICEF, uh, bringing together quality education to those disenfranchised from mainstream education using technology. And I can't wait to hear to know more from both of you. Uh, so I yield the floor to Oluwashna uh, to have her initial remarks. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I am Oluwashon Kolaoli from Nigeria, and I am super excited to be here. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers that Global Citizenship Foundation, I am. Thank you so much for having me. I think it is very um, important that you have put together such a very needed discussion, right? Um, and also for having me on this panel. I grew up in a conflict-stricken town here in Nigeria. So I have witnessed firsthand the detrimental impact of conflict on education and personal development. As a child, I was surrounded by you know, constant altercations. I found myself responding aggressively to difficult situations, you know, um, just because I did not have the necessary tools and skills to navigate conflict peacefully. And just like it is, it is common in many parts of the world. The education I received, you know, focused solely on basic literacy and math, just like you mentioned earlier, neglecting the crucial life skills like um, conflict resolution, emotional intelligence. And it really pain pains me to know that millions of children, about 468 million children, 
that is one in six actually live in conflict affect, uh, affected environment and they lack they lack access to not just quality quality is important but they also lack access to conflict sensitive education right and and essential skills and I, I strongly believe that without proper education, without proper conflict sensitive education and support, they also risk, you know, um, they are prone to perpetuating the cycle of, of, of violence, of, of conflict. By the way, I think I should explain what conflict sensitive education means. And it simply refers to, you know, the design and delivery of education programs and policies that are into or that take into recognition or account the conflict environment, the conflict setting. And the aim of this kind of education is to minimize the negative impact of conflict and maximize the positive impact, right? Um, as we all know, conflict is a very neutral energy. It is not positive or negative. It depends on how you respond to it. And this is where education comes in. In the face of conflict, education serves as a beacon of hope it, it offers a pathway towards peace. It offers a pathway towards uh, tolerance. It offers a pathway towards reconciliation. And just like Kofi Annan, I don't know if you guys know Kofi Annan, um, once said, education is quite simply peace building by another name. And I, I totally agree with him. Through education, I believe that we have the opportunity to nurture the next generation of peace builders. I am a peace builder by profession, and I understand the significance of um, catching them young and equipping them with the knowledge and the skills to effectively navigate and resolve conflict. You know, equipping them with the knowledge and skills and empathy they need to navigate complexities of conflict, help them emerge as positive agents of change, positive agents of positive peace. I think I should state, uh, state that. Um, I must also say that teaching learners um, skills like effective communication, empathy, equipping them with problem solving skills is extremely important. But we must also not neglect training of educators and parents as well. I believe that um, for us to have a safe and sustainable world, then we must take a whole school approach because this better positions us for getting a more holistic result, if, if, if you guys are with me. I am, I am excited that this topic is getting the attention that it deserves. I live in a country where we pay less attention to um, life skills. We, we, we are all for the hard skills. And so when, when I got the invitation for this panel, I was super excited because I was like, this is this is very important. We need all stakeholders. Um, we need all educators. We need parents. We need guardians. We need change makers. We need young people to shift focus to the importance of equipping young people with this skill from a very tender and young age. Most importantly, um, and I would love to end like this, I am glad that through this conversation, through discussions like this, we can come up with best practices practices, we can come up with better strategies, we can equip ourselves, um, because I believe that one of the problems that we have is actually lack of capacity. So if we are able to equip ourselves with the strategies, with the, um, with the skills, with everything that we need, uh, then it's, it becomes easier for everyone to effectively, you know, work towards creating safer schools and a safer world. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your initial remarks. Thank you so much for your initial remarks. Vanessa, I yield the floor to you. Thank you. Um, again, I would like to thank Aya and the Global Citizenship Foundation for inviting me onto this panel. I love your passion. I think that's something that is so needed for people who want to be change makers and who have a vision for the future. That passion is something that is so important. And I think that that just came through. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll share a little bit about myself. I um, I work for Sophia High School, which is a British um, accredited online school. We have students from around the world. My perspective of global uh, conflict resolution and working with educators and education to build in global citizenship and to build in conflict resolution and those amazing skills that we've just been discussing. That's really part of what we do in our program and what I do with the other projects that I'm involved with. So I work with Sophia. I also work with um, 
We also we have uh, students who are scholarship students from Ukraine who are still refugees. So we do have an element of that with us. My project at the moment is working with girls in Afghanistan for some uh, international agencies. So we have a multi-finger approach to how we develop these skills with our students. So although we're not based in conflict ourselves, the students that we work with, some of them are now and some of them have been and some of them are in areas where it continues around them. And so I think the focus of education that, is, that we really, really do focus on is how do we develop that resilience in our students? How do we develop those, develop those skills that they need? not just in large world conflict resolution because they're living in the middle of it, but also how could they make a difference in their own lives? How can they make a difference in the lives of their communities, their families? How do we develop those skills that we've just been discussing, mentioning? How can we develop those skills in ourselves? How can we then expand those skills within families, communities, and how can we develop a way of thinking, not just a way of working, but a way of thinking that is not about ourselves, that is focused on the bigger picture problems, that is focused on problems that other people have that we may not have. However, there's some connection. It's not just about empathy. It's about understanding. It's about consideration. And it is definitely about that communication. It's about the backwards and forwards, the exchange of ideas, which is why this is such a wonderful forum. It's about making sure that I can communicate my point of view and that you can communicate yours and I appreciate it. Do I have to accept it? Not necessarily because my perspective is different from yours, but I do appreciate it. And so when we build this into the work that we do with our students, it's really very, very central to the, the our purpose of the programme that we develop. Myself, I am an early years specialist, uh, which is they are the masters of conflict resolution. You ask a three and a four year old, you know, how do we resolve this conflict? They're all for the fairness. They're all for the rules. They're all for following. They're all for exploring. How far can you push the boundaries? So in my work with early years, over 30 odd years, this is something that is really intrinsic in everything that you do with those students, those young children, because they are experiencing the world for the first time in a range of ways, and it's not always going that way. So how do they resolve conflict? And what we learn from those early years students is what we can transpose to students as they are older and as they're more developed, because sometimes you can get a little bit lost as you're growing up and you feel, you know, I don't know my place in the world. And one of the things that you can come right back to is feeling secure in yourself, feeling secure in what you know, feeling secure that you can discuss with other people who are also secure in themselves. And if you find somebody is not, how do you adapt yourself to be in that situation? Adaptability, that's something that's really important for our students and for ourselves as well. I feel I'm not probably not quite as passionate in my speech, but I do feel as passionately that this is something that is core. It's definitely something that it's not a soft skill. It's a life skill. This is something that we should be teaching from the very earliest ages of education and through families as well and family education. I'm from the UK and I know that lots of communities around the world are now struggling, particularly after COVID, with those family dynamics, with what is the purpose of education, what relevance of education, because this, the world has changed so dramatically. And I think bringing it back to what are we teaching the youngest children and then expanding that through education, how are we supporting families who also live in conflict, not internal conflict as well as external conflict? And how are we working with the communities to bring a change in what we understand conflict resolution to be? It's not just a war, it's not just a time of conflict. It's really those interactions that we have on a daily basis that, that make us uncomfortable. And how can we develop comfort skills, being confident in ourselves? I think that's my perspective <laughs> there. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your insights, Vanessa. I, I think like both of you bring such diversity to the table. <laughs> and, and it's beautiful to hear both your context of how you look at conflict and how you work with conflict. So my question to both of you 
is like, you know, see, uh, we talk about conflict resolution to be part of something that we need to teach. So what do you think are the barriers that stop us from having, say, conflict resolution skills as co-foundational literacies, or like, you know, uh, uh, literacies that we uh, uh, work with, with young, young children, young just uh, basic math, listening, reading, writing uh, skills. So how, how so what do you think are that? You are breaking from my end. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Am I audible now? Okay, I think you're better. All right. Okay. So the question that I was asking you is, um, these skills that we are talking about, the conflict resolution skills, we sh should all be teaching them. Um, and you, you've been uh, experienced in the industry, in, in the education the field of education for a really long time. So what do you think are the barriers that stop us from having this as one of the foundational skills as we prepare young people? I think that's that's a policymaker uh, decision. That's something that low level people feel. There has to be a groundswell. I think this is something that if you speak to any educator, really anywhere in the world, these social emotional skills, these skills to connect with other people, these are the ones that are increasingly challenging. And I will come back to, to COVID because we do find with our own students that that's had a significant impact in social and emotional skills and that communication skills, not even language skills. Um, I think it really starts with for us in our school, what is the purpose? We actually have a document called Our Purpose. It's central to that. And we do that with all the students and all the projects that we work with. We're only a small voice, but we are one small voice of many millions. I think it really comes down to making a significant change within yourselves, your communities. That transactional shift will only happen with policymakers though. The, the understanding that this is not lesser than learning to read and write. This is an essential life skill as we've said, but I think that, that that groundswell is building. And I think that particularly if you look at curriculum options for students around the world, you've got um, the IB that has an emor enormous focus on this. You have, you know, IPC, IMYC that has, that's focused really, that's a delivery of the sustainable development goals. I work as myself as a global schools advocate and we talk about education for sustainable development. All those things are now in the mainstream of education. They're not something that, you know, somebody's gone off and it's one of those weird schools that you can send your child to. These are main school education programs. What needs to happen now and in the future and continuing is pressure on policymakers to say, this is a skill that is important. This is a skill that is foundational for us to move forward as a, as a person in the world. I don't think it, it ends with us, but I do think it starts with us. Yeah, I totally agree with Vanessa. Um, as a peace advocate here in Nigeria, one of the problems that we have is getting the government on board with um, implementing these these policies, right? Especially within the schools. So I get to engage with the United Nations, and one of the things that I have seen consistently um, when it comes to working with the government is their ability to pass the policies but their inability to implement the policies right so it's more like we know these are the things that should be done but we don't get to see them done right and this boils down in my context right africa this boils down to culture and societal norms um which is we are not exactly allowed to express emotions. And when we get to express the emotions, we express them negatively. Why? Because we are not equipped with these skills, right? So there's a culture of silence. There's a culture of not expressing. There's a culture of everybody downplaying the significance of life skills. Just like Vanessa said, um, it is not just an essential skill. Conflict is inevitable. If we say that... Um, everyone, when you go through life, you are definitely going to encounter conflict at one point of your life, then we must ensure that conflict literacy is, is, is important. Is It is not supposed to be relegated to the back. It is not something that we have to keep running after policymakers to engage with. It is something that everyone should own. But um, working also in my context, I've come to realize that we cannot all leave the assignment or the work 
to the policymakers alone. Now we have to stand up and take responsibility. You know, the schools have to ensure that we have, do you have a child protection um, policy in your school? Do you have a child pro um, protection um, um, committee in your school? Do you have the policies? Not only should you have those policies, how are you implementing them? And, you know, that takes me to another point, which is um, negative role models. <laughs> children don't just learn they they learn by seeing they learn by hearing right and so when they are surrounded by negative role models i had a conversation with one of one of my friends a couple of days back and we we're talking about positive discipline right which is also very important when it comes to conflict resolution and we we, we, we talked about how we as adults want to ensure that young people learn the right things while we're not doing the right things for them to see right so negative role models um stand as a barrier to effective conflict resolution skill right so if you are telling me to know how to communicate effectively if you are telling me to show some respect if you are telling me to show some empathy then i need you to to, to display it i want to see you do it first so negative role models stand as um stands as as a barrier to to ensuring that children are well equipped with conflict resolution if only we are able to go after a value-based approach to discipline right i'm um, letting them know that we're not trying to tell you to just stop doing this we're trying to ensure that we instill in you a positive culture we instill in you a value-based culture then wherever whenever with so whosoever you meet yourself or engage with we can be rest assured that you're going to you you know bring in these skills you're going to you're not going to disappoint us <laughs> if, if you get what i'm trying to say so yeah um lab, terrible societal norms and um negative role models i think those are the two barriers based on my context thank you wow that was powerful thank you for sharing uh really really interesting so um this reminds me of the unesco uh charter uh the beginning of it uh, where it talks about wars begin in the minds of people and re re rephrasing men as people out there. It is in the minds of people that defenses of peace must be constructed. So that's a very, very uh, strong and uh, beautiful articulation of, uh, of, of this idea that we're talking about conflict resolution. So I think UNESCO has been working on frameworks that, that enable that, spe specifically UNESCO MGIEP. They came up with this framework called EMC Square, which was empathy, compassion, mindfulness, and critical inquiry. Um, and I think we've been using that for quite some time now at, at our workplace, as well as like you know, the kind of work that we do. So my question to you is, in your toolbox, as you promote conflict resolution skills, uh, do you have certain frameworks that you rely on or uh, certain models that you look at as, as you uh, execute some of these uh, programs within your schools and uh, with your within your communities. So if they are, I'd be really happy to know uh, some of them that you uh, fall back on. So I've, I've got two hats. I can see in the chat there's lots of early years people as well. So for, for me, with my early years hat on, one of the points that came up was talking about emotions. And this is something that, although Sam, you, you have also mentioned, for us in early years, it's name the emotion talk about it, recognize it in yourself, then you recognize it in others. Once you recognize it in others, you can you can then understand that people have different feelings and you approach them based on the understanding that they may feel different to you. So from the very, very beginning of what we, when we work with children in the very early years, it is all about emotions and connecting to the feeling. I connect to my feeling, I connect to your feeling as well. And I think that that central moving through life that we have that basic basic understanding so moving as we get older we'll we look at the esd competencies um which is a great framework if you're if you're not looked at that global citizenship um you can look at the global schools foundation as well they also have amazing resources we look at the esd competencies in light of where our students are within our classroom context. Now we are an online school. So our students are really around the world. 
we have early morning and late shift depending on which time zone you're in but our students inhabit a classroom with other students from all over the world so inherent in that is a, an understanding that not everybody is in the same place feeling the same feelings and having the same experiences. So our students have a very different understanding of what a global classroom looks like. Um, and, and conflict re resolution from that point is really understanding that everybody is coming from somewhere different. We understand it and we accept it. And we also then move forward to support whatever challenges they have, the way that other students would move forward to support whatever challenges you have. So you have like a microcosm of really working together, regardless of where you are. So we've got different languages, different cultures, everything is enmeshed in, in our different classrooms. So that work that we do with the students there is really quite significant. And, and we would obviously like to share that with more students as we move forward. But this is really a model that we've developed to make to bring to life the belief that we have that is students have a, a it's a valid right of all students to have a range of emotions. And I want to come back to that because this is something particularly in that, you know, rights of the child that's really important. You cannot go around <laughs> thinking, you know, we tell students all the time, oh, stop crying or don't do this, or you know, it's time to grow up or be a man really invalidating the feelings that they have and and the trauma that goes with repeated invalidation of feelings is significant and that really is a barrier i think to understanding yourself and therefore understanding others so working together to connect with each other to connect with yourself to understand the different challenges in whatever setting that you're in um, is really significant. But again, I'm going to come back to those. Everything is a C word for us. It's communication, collaboration, you know, all those good, good stuff. I think those are the things, but again, those ESD competencies, they are really life skills. And I can see in the chat that people are talking about life skills. And I think the relevance of education is shifting. It's not just about, do you know the facts? Can you recite the curriculum? It's really about, what are we educating students for in the future? If we're not educating them to be collaborative and communicative, uh, communicative and creative and to have compassion, that, that is something that is the aim of any education system anywhere. That is the aim of family education systems, community education systems, and historically through time, this is what we have been using education for. It's not just content knowledge, and it shouldn't be about content knowledge. It should be about skills for life. Um, from the very, very earliest, when I talk about this is when I, I feel happy, I look like this. If you look like that, how do you feel? to looking at the larger picture of understanding why there is inequality, why there is, and, and how we can start to tackle that because conflict, it's internal as well as external. Thank you, Vanessa. Oluwasho. Thank you, Vanessa. Your passion, your passion is seeping through. <laughs> and I totally love it. Um, here, I work as a safe school advocate, and um, one of the things that we do is to go from school to school to train not just the, the students. I'm going to pay more attention to the teachers now, since Vanessa has emphasized the need of emotional intelligence, empathy on the side of the students. Um, but I, I strongly also believe that it is high time we started paying some attention on the teachers as well, just to support what she has said, right? Um, the teachers are the ones to train these children, right? And um, in, in Nigeria, we have a, a national policy plan on, on safety, um, security, and violence-free schools. And this serves as a, plat um, a, a, a tool for us to ensure that schools become safe places for children, and not only children, but also teachers. Um, recently, there, there have been a lot of kidnappings in schools, right? Because Nigeria is, is almost an, um, um, a conflict-affected area right now. And there have been a lot of kidnappings, a lot of... Um, um, repurposing school structures as as military bases, right? And this is why I said it is very important for us to want to ensure that teachers are effectively equipped, not only 
Now, conflict resolution is all encompassing, right? Um, from from peace, teaching children how to um, how to be respectful, how to effectively communicate, how to see from other people's perspective, but also seeing that teachers are well equipped with these skills as well. For for me, um, in my organization, we organize teachers teachers training programs, which you call safe teachers program. And um, we have three models, right? Um, the conflict resolution module, the um, child protection and safeguarding module. And um, also we have, um, now it's, 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 it has, it has literally left my head. Yeah, the, the classroom management, right? And all of these modules are supposed to help the teacher become a total teacher, right? So you're not just teaching the child how to um, solve mathematics. You're not just teaching them how to speak. But in your teaching, you are demonstrating these skills. You are establishing clear expectations, right? So when a child comes into your class, we know what to expect. And when you cross the lines, we know how to deal with these issues. Now, these are skills that teachers in Africa and um, um, I would like to say over the world, all over the world, I've not exactly paid attention to, and um, which is why um, I don't know if you know about the Safe Schools Declaration, right? It's a document for schools to implement to ensure that children, teachers, and every member of the school community is effectively prepared for any form of violence, any form of conflict, and any form of, um, of occurrence that might hinder, you know, the smooth. Um, communication or the smooth um, education that they're supposed to get, right? So all of these policies are what we use to ensure that we're not only raising peaceful children, but we're also equipping teachers to help us train peaceful children. And I, I, I also strongly believe that if the, if the, if the teachers are well equipped, right, um, just like Vanessa said, if there is a sense of peace, internal peace, in the teachers, there's a way they're able to pass that across to, to the students as well. There's a way they're able to pass that across to their children or to the children in their in um, in their care, right? So working with teachers, training them on classroom management, training them on conflict resolution, how, how do you mediate between two students that are having issues? How do you train them to negotiate? How do you train them to communicate their emotions without violence? You know, all of these skills, all of these things are what we use to ensure that we, 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 we shape safe schools, not only safe schools, but safe children as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, both of you. Like, I think this is really exciting to see, like, you know, uh, how the ideas are converging out here. Uh, I just wanted to share with you an experience that I had, uh, specifically in terms of, like, you know, um, engaging in dialogue and conflicts within the workspace. So when we launched the program called Mentor Program a few years ago, one of the one of the things that we saw was young people who come in to work with us, uh, they would not have an effective way of giving feedback. Uh, and sometimes the feedback would be something that would trigger a conflict as opposed to it resolving the conflict. So we tried bringing in concepts and frameworks, like say, for example, uh, there's this feedback mechanism called OFNR, that's observations, feelings, needs, and requests. So the emphasis that you had on feelings and um, uh, what do you call um, emotions, I think this is really, really important in the way we shape. And I think models like these, if perhaps we can drive in education, I think we would have a, 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 what do you call better prepared learners, not just in their own personal life, but also perhaps for the work. So my next question to you is in terms of teacher education. So you see a lot of teachers, you interact with teachers. Now, in my experience of working with almost uh, for a decade with teachers, one thing I've seen is teachers are really, really struggling with a lot of challenges like burnout and overwork. And still we do see uh, people come in, like we have almost about 200 odd educators right now uh, live with us. So the idea that like, you know, uh, people take time out to come update themselves, um, even at spaces where they're not encouraged. Like I've met educators who, who go out of their way to like, you know, do what they do. So personally, my, my question to you on this is teachers are doing a lot. They're 
quite busy. So if there are any, uh, what do you call, strategies that you had that could make their job easy in terms of like, you know, uh, doing uh, this work of uh, building conflict resolution skills, uh, what would some of the tips be from your point of view for a teacher who's busy, but really well-meaning and like, you know, wants to contribute and be engaged, but does not have time? So how, how would you uh, uh, advise them? So I, I work with a lot of teachers over many years. Um, one of the things I must say, I, 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 we have to appreciate the pressures that teachers are going through now. There's in the chat, it's about, you know, parents are always right. Students have got reduced skills. There's other pressures going on. And I think we have to give teachers a bit of a break. We can't keep piling things on top of them. And one of the things I have to say is it's not a teacher's responsibility to instill this on her own or on his own. This is something that starts, well, even if you can't start top down, it starts with the management of the school. It starts with the ethos of the school. It starts with the policies of the school. Teachers can make a difference. They can bring this. We'd like to start this. We feel it's important. And the school really should be responsive. It really, the school should be saying, this is what we feel is important for our students. We've listened to the feedback from teachers. We've listened to the feedback from students. We look at school, global trends. Putting the pressure on single teachers to do this on themselves is, it will be lovely, but it's also really problematic. I think we have to, we have to look at the, the world that the teacher lives in. So I, I like a question, but I think it's, it's a slightly different question that I'm going to answer. Schools, they have to be responsive. Any kind of business, any kind of community has to be responsive to its members. If enough members are saying, we'd like to see change, this is what we would like, it is the business of that community or that school or business to look at that and see how can this happen. Who can guide us? People within, this is what we're looking at, entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, people within. Who wants to work within this community to bring about change? Then you can start to bring in the external support. Well, there's this course you can take. There's resources here. This is a network that you can join. So you're not doing it on your own. But within the school, it's not one person. It's got to be a group of people we'd like to see. Who would like to join this working party? Which parents would like to join us? Which student body is going to support this? So it becomes a multi-stakeholder change. It can be started by one person, but it cannot be built and it cannot be sustained by one person. So I think working with groups of teachers in the past, responsive. What are we looking at? What is curriculum policy changing? What is it saying we need to do? What is current research showing that we need to do? What is the student voice saying, the parent voice saying? What is international research saying? There's great research communities out there that share with schools. This is what's going on. This is about student happiness. This is about teacher happiness. Finding those resources, having a community that can bring them together, having school boards that listen, having district groups that listen, having people who want to take action and who in themselves have developed amazing conflict resolution skills because you're not going to bring this together if you don't already have those already. And as we've been talking about, it's modeling those. You don't want to get into some massive argument as you're going through because what you're saying is, I need as much help as everybody else, which is good to admit, but it's not great when you're modeling to other people in that community. So I think, again, it's back to that whole groundswell and, and where can we find resources and how can we engage our school leadership and our boards and our districts and then uh, again back into policy? How can this make a change? Teachers definitely make a change within their own classrooms because they set the tone. They have that lovely atmosphere when you walk in. They are always polite and kind, they're respectful, and they set their classroom rules. However, it's more than one classroom. So I think building that community within your school, within your group, within your, within your district, that's really important that you aren't left to do it alone and that you feel supported. Thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, what should you uh, add to uh, what Vanessa has already shared? I have one question uh, for you specifically. You worked on um, bridges to uh, peace camp uh, with uh, the UN and ANI. 
So my question to you is, what were the key takeaways from that project that you did that that can also inform or enrich educators uh, through through your takeaways and um, your ideas from that project? So am I supposed to answer the one I asked earlier and this one? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, all right. So just to add to what Vanessa has said, I mean, Vanessa has years of experience in this thing. So um, you, you cannot imagine how excited I am to be learning all of these things from you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, just to add to what she has said, collaboration, I have seen that um, it can be hard to help teachers own any in any new initiative when they are not well carried along when when it comes to the designing of the initiative right and um there, there, there must be a sense of ownership if we are talking about bringing in conflict resolution um policies into the school we want to be able to partner with our teachers too you know, um, establish these policies and procedures. And that, 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 that brings me to collaboration. We must um, see that they are well carried along. We partner with them. We will hear from them. We know what they want. We know what their challenges are. And that way we are able to design projects or design programs that actually speak and tackle the issues that they are facing, right? And this also breeds a sense of ownership. Now, when you bring in the, the policies or when you bring in the pro procedures, they, they, they can say that, oh, we did this together. We must see that this is well implemented. We must align. We must call, um, cooperate. We must see that we get the results from this. So um, encouraging collaboration amongst teachers is, is very vital. And um, I, like I've always said since this conversation started, promoting a whole, a whole school approach. The work is not supposed to be only to the teachers or for the teachers, we must bring in every member of the school. And that includes students, that includes their parents, because at the end of the day, when teachers do their jobs in school, they will still go back home. The children will still go back home. And if the, if the parents are not aligned with whatever it is that the teachers are teaching in school, then there will be a conflicting interest. So the, the child is learning something else in school and learning something else at home. And there's just confusion all over the place, right? So we want to ensure that we promote a whole school approach where every member of the, of the school, the students, the teachers, the parents, the counselors, the administrators, the community leaders, are well you know um invested in ensuring that we see the implementations of the of these policies and procedures i think that answers that question now to the second question um i had the privilege of of designing and implementing the bridges to peace boot camp here in nigeria in partnership with the united nations information center and um, the american negotiation institute and hmm, I learned two lessons from that experience. And it, the first one is that young people no longer want to be seen as victims of conflict, right? They want to be seen as active participants of change or active change makers. There's been this stereotype um that young people have had to cross and deal with over the years and it is that we are victims of of of, of conflict we are not just victims we are also change makers we are also if i'm being honest um i believe that there is no generation that is as interested as um as seeing a more peaceful and sustainable world as this current generation of young people right so we we need to move our perspective and shift our focus or our gaze from seeing children seeing young people as victims but also active change makers. And that was the first lesson that I learned because when we put out the call for this boot camp, we were expecting just 100 people, but we had almost a thousand people apply for this boot camp. And that blew my mind because these are the things that we do not often talk about. Who, who organizes conflict resolution for young people? Who, who cares about negotiation skills for young people? But that changed my perspective and it made me see how we have the ability to unnest this energy, this, this eagerness, this power that young people have. And then the second, the second lesson that I learned is uh, we need funding. 
I don't know if, <laughs> if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> Young change makers need funding. I, I believe you can you can relate with me, Ian, because you you are also an executive director. It was a struggle to see or to get funding. And I must say this that when it comes to safe schools, when it comes to peace education, when it comes to conflict resolution, this is one field that does not get the attention and the funding that we need. We don't really. We we pay more attention. Um, on education and it gets me wondering and it gets me gets me thinking if there is no peace there can be no education if there is no safety and security there can be no education right so um i realize that we do not have funding we do not have um the political will from from the government we only hear the words but we do not see the action so i think those are the two lessons that i learned um that young people are eager to bring the change um if we are provided the right um trainings the right facilities the right amenities the right um equipment the right tools which i think which is why i think that conferences or forums like this are very important, right? Um, to help equip young people, to help them see that we believe in you. We, we, we must do away with the tokenism. <laughs> I think I should, I should end with that. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you, you spoke my mind with the funding thing. <laughs> I'm with you on the funding. I think, if you, I think that's a very important point to make, Oluwase, and I think that's so important because Everybody would like change, and everybody's got will. I know, you know, what what is the funding for it? It's really dramatic when you look at priorities for funding. If you see it's such a high importance, where is the money for it? I, I think that's a significant part of everything, even down to you know the smallest teacher in the smallest classroom to the largest organisation. Where are your priorities? Because where your priorities lay, that's where the money goes. Yeah. If there's no funding, how serious are you about, about making a change? I think that's a dramatic point to make, for sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I, I think the first point you were talking about, parents' education, I think that's so critical. Uh, this is one thing that we discovered. So uh, when we launched the Global Citizenship Schools Initiative in 2016, 2017, um, a lot of people didn't know what Global Citizenship Education was in the context that we were working in and a lot of schools were very interested about fostering global citizenship but the question was like what exactly do we teach within global citizenship so that was the thing so the thing that we did was we had schools set up certain structures like when you say you're talking about how one person can start it but they cannot sustain it that's that was the idea that we had and when we had these committees within schools that would look at different aspects of uh, the whole school approach, one of them including uh, one committee that included like, you know, connecting with parents and uh, experts within the community that they are, that they can bring and introduce kids to. So I think that really, really worked for us when we're doing it. So when the kind of ideas that both of you have shared are things that I'm like, wow, this has actually worked for us. And I think this is something that we can take it forward. And the second thing that I think resonated with me was not to look at uh, people as victims, but as change makers, but also not to look at students as perhaps like, you know, uh, recipients of knowledge, but to look at active co-creators. And I think OECD has an amazing framework uh, called, um, what do you call it? They have this uh, co-agency model that they talk about, like, you know, learn a co-agency. So I think that's, that's a beautiful way of like constructing projects and programs within the school. So these, these are things that uh, your ideas and words inspire me to uh, reflect and think about. And I think I have one suggestion for schools. Uh, uh, perhaps I, I, I'm sure like, you know, uh, you may agree, um, nonprofits have a vital role to play in terms of like, you know, building knowledge and providing uh, care services around these thematic areas. So perhaps identifying institutions uh, like Vanessa's, which is working in a very different model and try to see what what new things that they are doing that you could learn in trying to uh, transform your school spaces and perhaps like, you know, uh, looking at future space, uh, what you call future shapers uh, that Old Washington is working on and perhaps to see what kind of association that you can have to maybe foster or maybe even Global Citizenship Foundation and see what kind of projects and work. And 
I, I think these, this kind of cross collaboration in this field, I feel like, is also something that has benefited a lot of them. And I think it would benefit if we do it a lot more. So that was my take. And now I open the floor to questions from each other. So uh, I yield the floor to Anissa again. I seem to go first. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'll just share that in our school structure, we have a co-leadership structure. And one of our co-leaders is actually the Global Citizenship and Community Officer. So she is lead, a senior leader in school, and that is the focus of what she does. And I think if I can give one takeaway from what we do, it's really that is a key role in our leadership structure. We value it. That is a, a pay. The financing is there. That's a paid leadership role. And the focus is how can we develop global citizenship and work within communities as, as that's a senior leadership role. And I think that I would definitely share that as an idea that something that other schools can work towards or, or embrace. I think what Oluwaseyam is saying with, with her different perspective of where she's she is, because I'm coming from here, she's coming from there, we're meeting in the middle. The other thing that I want to, I've really, th I think about this a lot, I think about a lot of things a lot, but key points, alignment of vision. Every stakeholder has to have a buy-in and have an alignment of vision. We all know where we are, we all know where we want to get there, and we all know how, how we can work together to get on that path. Clearness and effective communication, transparency, very, very important. And I think the, the, the community sharing of goals is really important as well. So they're my three takeaways from, from our discussion. I think we both have had those those points made. Um, although I see, I think I'm more interested to learn about your projects because they're so, I mean, just mind blowing. How did that come about? What, what was your, how did you get that alignment of vision? Um, and how did you feel at the end of that project? Did it end or did it just start a different project? Okay, thank you so much, Vanessa. So I was trying to like take down your question just so that I okay. do not forget. So the, your first question was, how did I get alignment of the vision, right? Yes. Okay. How did you get everybody in, on board? Okay, so um, right now, Nigeria is hot. <laughs> um, when I mean hot, I mean conflict hot, right? We are literally um, in the center of conflict especially where i live i live in the fct um, abuja um, that's part of the northern part of nigeria and um, over the years we've had a lot of kidnappings of children mass kidnappings we had one in 20 i think 2014 there were about of over 200 children were kidnapped from the school and till now some of them have still not been returned and recently we had over 287 children kidnapped from the school again this year um so everyone can see the need for safe schools everyone can see the need for um training children or equipping them with conflict resolution skills right from a very tender age because most of the perpetrators of this violence, most of them are um, not trained, they're not educated. So not only are the policy makers, not only um, are the government agencies seeing the need for peace education, they're seeing the need for conflict resolution skills starting from the school. Right, so when I was going to design the Bridges to Peace Bootcamp, so let me, let, let me say, Peace Shapers, which is my organization, we we work or we partner with underserved children to tackle school violence and shape, um, shape safe schools and um, support them to make positive impacts, right? So what we've been able to do over the years is get or design projects that equip young people with these skills, with these life skills, with these necessary skills, um, but also get them to be mentored, right? So we don't just leave you on your own, we ensure that we have a platform where we provide opportunities, we keep up with you, we see that we've not just given you the skills, we've also provided an opportunity for you to implement the skills, which is one of our core pillars in Peace Shapers, um, that is called service learning or experiential learning, right? And um, as, a, as a peace builder, I have I've come to realize that 
it is extremely important that we provide platforms for young people to demonstrate the skills that they've learned. That is how they can see that what they've learned are actually important, right? They, they, they are really needed. When you bring in the case studies, when you bring in the life situations and they're able to get into action and solve a problem, there's this excitement, there's this fulfillment that they derive from that. And that is what stirs up the change making, right? So um, when we sent out the mails to our partners, they saw the need. They saw the need. We sent them... Um, the policy brief, we sent them the project um, design, we helped them to see why we have designed this project and why we need them on board. Of course, it took a lot of convincing, but it didn't take so much because <laughs> because they can see the problem, right? And I strongly believe that when partners see the problem, then it is easier for them to want to to work with you, it is easier for them to want to put in their best, to also want to invest. So when it comes to alignment of vision, we all we had to do was get our research, get the facts, get the evidences, sent it down, um, and we started the stakeholders engagement back and forth, and we were able to get the United Nations in, we were able to get the American negotiation um, in. Um, also, seeing that young people are looking for opportunity for social impact we are a lot of young people are looking for platforms to to show their skills right so we, um, through that boot camp we're able to bring in young volunteers um we're able to design the project with them so we asked them questions what are the things i mean that speaks to what ian spoke about um co-ownership or co-design co-creation um, we've passed the age of us sitting down in our little room and thinking that this is what is needed for these people there is now a human-centered approach to designing project right so we were able to carry along these young people ask them questions um and because of those questions, we're able to design a project that was more relevant to them. And that way, we're able to get more people on board. I think that answers the first question. And now I cannot remember the second question. So please, do you want to say that again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I so remember. I'm overwhelmed with, with the amazing <laughs> challenge that you took on. I think that's just amazing. That's just fantastic. Okay, um, I think you, you asked about some of our projects. I think that was your second question. Right, so we have the Bridges to Peace Bootcamp. Um, we have um, the WAVE Advocacy Tour. So the WAVE Advocacy Campaign is working against violence in education campaign. And um, that allows us to um, work with different stakeholders with parents we also have a faculty of, of of learning and education and what our faculty is about is um we we have gathered experts in conflict resolution in child protection and safeguarding in classroom management and in child-centered um, um, teaching skills right so all of those experts work together with our schools so we have a safe schools network these are the schools that have decided to work with peace shapers to ensure that their schools are safe and secure for for learning for students right so in those schools as well once you join the safe schools network we come in and um, we create something we call shape clubs so shape clubs is like peace clubs just a play with words of shapers, right? So shape clubs and um, through shape clubs, we equip our children, that is the students. So when we start to work with, with a school, they become our students. They become, we adopt the school, right? So we work with those schools to create shape clubs and um, we teach them on conflict resolution. We teach them on emotional intelligence. We teach them on negotiation and um, also peer mediation. So, so that um, they are able to, to put into action what they've learned over the course of the months and um, training sessions with them. Also, we have a Shapers Ambassadors program, and that program is basically um, a platform. So I mentioned us providing platform, which is a part of um, our core pillars. So we provide platforms for these underserved children to, to sit at the tables 
to to participate to bring in their own their own ideas right we don't want them to be left out when it comes to decisions that affect their lives so we want to be able to provide platforms for them to get into those rooms so we get to work with the united nations um get invited for some of some of their conferences so um through the shapers ambassadors program we ensure that we bring in these children from low income communities that are not exposed, they do not have access to, to all of these things and bring them into the rooms. And what, one thing that we believe that will help them do, and one thing that we have seen happen is it exposes them to possibilities, right? Um, to change, to seeing how their voices really matter when it comes to decision making. So for peace shapers, we are basically empowering the next generation of peace builders, right? Bringing them on and letting them know that we really care, we value your opinions, and we will implement those those suggestions. So yeah, that's basically what we do. That's amazing. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much, Vanessa. <laughs> All right, your questions. Well, so Vanessa, I again, I I should say that I'm super excited to be here, listen to you. Um, I started my peace building work a couple of, should I say just four years ago, but you have been in this for over, should I say 30 years now, if I'm correct? Yeah, and yeah. It, long time. <laughs> yes, very long time. I was not even born when you started. <laughs> Um, I know that you, you mentioned um, working online, so your school is an online school. Um, as a digital peace builder, I do understand the importance of technology when it comes to creating safety and security for young people, but I also understand the negative side. So let's call this the dark side of technology where um, um, technology can be used to push hate speech. It can be used to um, propagate terrible propagandas, right? So I would like to ask, how do you believe the role of technology can enhance conflict resolutions in schools? I don't know if you understand what I just asked. Yeah, I do. I do. And I think that really comes by, as you said, this is a, this is the, the, the our purpose of our school is to promote global citizenship and to promote peace and understanding and in, inherent in that is conflict resolution. Students who join us, we have a very clear policy. We are kind, we are respectful and anything that is out of that, we will discuss, but there will be consequences. And I think this is something that's um, missing from, from quite a lot of education at the moment. I think it's the choice and the consequence. So ask all students, you have a choice. You can have this behavior or this behavior. There's this consequence or there's this consequence. So I think it doesn't matter if you're in an online school or a physical school, the choice and the consequence is always there. When we look at respect for ourselves, which is very important, particularly in a world where you can be increasingly isolated by working online. Something that you yeah. want is respect for yourself and respect for everybody else in the community. But it starts with respect for self. And we're very clear on how, how we work together with students to do that. And that includes parents. We have a lot of programs when we onboard students about being respectful for yourself, for others, using the digital tools. We do some work in the metaverse. We work with the Metaverse Education Council to develop rules of engagement within that space, because one of the things that everybody says is, you know, online, there's no rules, all this horrible stuff happens because nobody bothered to set the boundaries in the beginning. So we worked last year and the year before with Metaverse Education Council to develop with our students what a safe space would look like and what those rules of engagement would look like for students within that. I mean, that's a doubly anonymous space because you're not even showing a face there. You are using an avatar. Mm -hmm. The benefit that I think that you can have from technology is we have a, our key phrase is any child anywhere. You mm -hmm. don't have, as long as you can access, and I'll be honest with you, you don't even have to access the internet. You can prepare an amazing scheme of work with amazing pre-recorded lessons that are relevant. You can pop it on a USB stick and you can post that to a teacher who's remote. All she has to do is have a laptop or a screen. She can plug it in and quality education can be shared. This is something, it's not new. They've had radio schools in different yeah. parts of the world, in Africa, in Australia. You know, you've had a way of accessing quality education. What technology does is has the possibility to raise it to another level. 
it, it's it's got to be done right. There's very little oversight in what happens with online schools. In the UK, we're very lucky that the government implemented a, a, a framework and schools can go through an accreditation process to make sure that they meet the standards of a, of a British school. Our standard of education is the same as a live school. That's a voluntary scheme at the moment. And it's one of the first internationally. But I think the impetus is there to move forward with the quality of education. And quality is not just about the curriculum that you're delivering. It's about the way the students that connect with each other. We only have six students in the class. We make sure that that community is, is very strongly built. It's Again, you've focused on this a lot, and I think it's about the teacher training. It's about the modeling of the teacher. It's about the possibilities that the school board see for that school. We have innovative co-founders, Melissa and Dan McBride, who really have thought about what a school means. We talk about relevance of curriculum and we think about it and we try and action what relevant curriculum is to make education meaningful for students again. So we're not just following, you know, we, we're British, we need to do this. We can enhance it with lots of other things. We have post-16 students that have been out of education that join us. How can we re-engage them? How can we make curriculum relevant to them again? These are all questions that we ask and we have to find solutions for because it's live working for us. It's very on the go. So I think, yes, there is a negative side. And I think all the stuff that we've talked about today about conflict resolution goes to, goes to that self-respect, yeah. respect for others. If you have, my personal motto is work hard, be kind. You know, I think if we all had that motto of being kind, then then we would have a different perspective on life. I think society is pushing students to have a different view of society and view of themselves, which I think is very sad. The way that technology can be used, it can, everything can be used for good or evil. Um, I think if you go into it with a view that we're going to be the ones that do good, we're going to be the ones that set the boundaries for what we want, what we expect, what our students should be. And we develop that actively and, and in a very similar way that you do, which is involving the students in the discussion, involving them in the it's active learning. It's not receiving information. It's being a participant in their own education. It's about allowing them to make decisions. It's about, about allowing them to make that choice and then suffer the consequence, whatever it is, because that's what life is about. Education is a microcosm for what we, have, we face when we leave education. And so developing those skills within a safe, it's, you come back to the safe schools, I really love that. Developing this framework and developing these standards for self within a safe space is so significant for so many children around the world because sometimes school is the only safe space that we have and we have to recognize that. Um, and I think that technology is just another way that we can create a safe space for students. Yes, that's going to go on over there, but in this safe space, this is what we expect. This is what we see. This is what we want for you. And this is what we will endeavor to support you as you reach. Um, I'm hoping that that's answered that question for you. Yes, thank you so much, Vanessa. <laughs> thank you, Vanessa and Russell, uh, for sharing that. One a quick question for both of you, and I think it's a very personal question. Um, could you share with us a challenge? This is from the audience. Uh, I think it's in particular. Could you kindly share with us a challenge that you're currently endeavoring to overcome with a glimmer of hope that eventual triumph is attainable? <laughs> Okay, I will tell you, from my perspective, it's about teamwork. It's about communities. It's about being supported. I think it doesn't matter how really terrible your day has gone, if there is somebody there who's in your network who can support you, who will guide you on. We have a, we have a, a, a mentorship program for everybody in our school, and I also mentor um, UK teachers for the Department for Education, and I also have a mentor. I think the glimmer of hope can be the fact that you are connected to a person and a community that feels the same way, that has the same values. And I think as long as you have somebody there to lift you up, 
it's very it's easy to fall down but it's also important that there is someone there to lift you up or a community to lift you up so i think the glimmer of hope is i'm not on my own thank you Vanessa. thank you so much for sharing that to be thank honest you. i think i think it's the same um, because when it comes to pouring into people, then you also want someone that is able to pour into you as well, right? And that is the work we do. We work with children, we work with um, diverse stakeholders. And um, for many of us, what pushes us is the passion to see the change, right? And uh, if I'm being honest, burnout is very real. <laughs> burnout is real, and that that's where... Um, self-care and paying attention to your mental health really comes in right knowing that it is only a person that is alive and healthy that can actually create change right so um, a challenge that i'm facing is being able to effectively balance working as um, a peace builder or a safe school advocate um and as well do every other thing so i currently also work with another organization as a corporate social impact officer and that's just you know balancing those two things i really do not believe in balance i just believe in you being able to show up and do what you need to do when you need to do it right and um what has really helped you all answering the question of a glimmer of hope is knowing that i can easily withdraw sometimes and just pay attention to myself and just care for myself and just um, re-energize, recharge. And when I am able to do that, then I can deliver. I can give more. I can serve more. This work is service to me, right? I want to be able to give myself. Um, I want to be able to give my best, not just myself. So my glimmer of hope, just like Vanessa said, is a community knowing that even when I decide to take some time back, some time out, um, I have people that are there to support, people that are there to encourage, people that are there to motivate. And I think the beneficiaries that we work with, seeing their lives change, um, because as peace builders, as people that work with children, that work with people, what we really go for is a behavioral change, right? So when I see that change, even if it is a little, there's this excitement. Oh, there is hope here. Then, then let, let's keep going. So yeah, that's that's the challenge, and that's my glimmer of hope. The challenge is trying to find a balance, handling every other thing, and um, the hope is knowing that I can easily withdraw, and there is there is going to be me, a better me, providing a better service. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think we, we're going to take one last question uh, before we hear up the discussion. And the question that we have is, uh, do you have any strategies on how to respond to conflicts within the classroom where children are involved? So this is by, as previously, this is by my health care. hook up. I'm sorry. Okay, I cannot hear you. Okay, do you have any strategies um, or tips on how to respond respond to conflicts happening within the classroom with children? Well, I I would like to. Okay, I don't know if Vanessa was going to. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. So, um, the first thing first is, um, is to establish clear expectations, right? Um, there must be a proactive approach to conflict resolution. We don't have to be reactive. We have to think ahead and um, set clear expectations. So when a crowd comes into your class, when children come into your class, you want to be able to say, these are the expectations. If you do this, what should we do? And um, it is not you coming up with the ideas. You want them to come up with the ideas themselves. So when they flaunt the rule, they can easily say, oh, we were the ones that actually created this rule. So you want to be able to create or establish clear expectations. And um, secondly, you want to be able to um, teach them effective communication and basically everything that we've been talking about all through the 
conversation, right? Um, teach them to effectively communicate their emotions, teach them to um, use the I statements in such a way that they, they can say, okay, this is what is wrong with me, but not also pushing the blame on the other person. Um, we also... And this, this is very important because the moment you start to push the blame on another person, the other person becomes defensive and that just escalates the conflict, right? Um, another thing, another strategy is uh, emotional intelligence. P children need to know or be self-aware of the kind of emotion that they are experiencing. And not only should they be self-aware, they also have to be able to self-regulate those emotions. And so as a teacher, you want to be able to tell them, okay, calm down. Breathe in, breathe out, walk with them through, you know, um, de-escalating the situation, right? Um, help them to manage their emotions. If they need to cry, just be there to, to, to pacify and just make them know that, oh, this is a safe space. And um, I think also very important, teachers must learn to separate the people from the problems, right? So I, I remember one thing that Vanessa said, um, children at the early stages are learning, right? They are new to a lot of things, right? Um, and that's, that bestows on us the responsibility to help them walk through a lot of things as well, right? So when they do some things, we must be able to see that, oh, this is not supposed to be taken personally. They do not exactly mean it this way. So we must be able to separate the people from the problems, um, separate the children from the problem and face the problem heads on and that, that also speaks to how we also communicate with these children when they're experiencing any any form of conflict so the effective communication both on the side of the teacher and as well on the side of the of, of the children also us validating their emotions and letting them know that whatever it is that you're feeling right now is actually very valid if you're angry it is very valid if if you're if you just want to be on your own it is very valid so validating their emotions de-escalates any conflict in in the classroom um lastly i would say um teach them to negotiate and that's where problem solving skills or critical thinking comes in. At the end of the day, when children get into conflict, it is often because of a need or an interest, right? So what do they really want? And when they're able to express what they really want, teach them to resolve that conflict, teach them to, to, to solve that problem. Right. So when you teach children to think, to critically think and provide solution, then we are raising better adults. We are raising people that even in the face of difficult conversations, they will not run off. They'll be able to stand there and be assertive to to place a demand on what they need without hurting the other person. That is also where empathy comes in. I can get what I want without hurting the other person. I must be able to see from that other person's perspective. So I think this, these are basic strategies to respond to conflicts in the classroom. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> Vanessa, I think you like got them all. I think you got them all there. I think for myself, I, think, I mean, that was very comprehensive. I think I work a lot and we say connect to the feeling. So for our, even for all students, I think, you know, identify your own feelings. What do they look like? What does other people, what do other people feel? What do they look like when they feel? Can I name that emotion? Because sometimes complex emotions are difficult to name. Moving, moving on again, it's about, it is about problem solving skills, skills, and it's about connecting to yourself. If I face this problem, how would I like it to be resolved? And therefore, I can apply that to somebody else. Well, maybe they would like the same, the same kind of resolution. The language that you use is absolutely key. I statements, not you statements. And I talk to teachers about this a lot as well, because they say, oh, when this child does this, it makes me. Uh -uh. No, when this child does this, you feel. You have to own your own emotions. You have to own your own responses. So... I statements and not you statements, because if you use a you statement, as you said very clearly, you're passing it on to somebody else. And you can't pass how you feel onto somebody else. How you respond to their actions, you have to own for yourself. Clearly communicating how that feeling is making you feel, very, very key. And not apportioning blame, analyzing a situation. This is what it is. This is how I feel about that. 
you did this, you feel a different way. I acknowledge that, but we have to come to some understanding about how that works together. So the language is very, very key. And I think that again, looking at bigger problems, it's really not all about you. I talk to some of our older students about this when they say, oh, but, <coughs> excuse me, this is going to happen. And we say, nobody's thinking about you. They're all thinking about themselves. Yeah. Having some perspective is very important. Getting somebody to turn the camera on in an online lesson is a challenge, but important for safeguarding. Nobody cares what you look like. They're too busy thinking about what do they look like? What are they saying? We place a lot of importance on other people when we can be introspective a little bit. So I think that's really important. A lot of actions take place sometimes because other people are viewing and the expectation is that I respond in a certain way because I have to be a leader or I have to be this or I have to be that. So I think the understanding that most people are not thinking about you and they're thinking about themselves is really important as a, as a, as a life skill for students moving forward. Again, it, 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 as an early years person, I think about the children who were three, four, five, but I also work with children who were 17, 18, 19. Those things are comprehensive regardless of what age I'm teaching. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts, Renee, and the last thing. Uh, we almost at the end of our discussion. But I have a song written next to people that are all done in the day. So this is a ghost called C from the Nasdaq MBIT. I think it's a very best way to you can have a look at. Uh, perhaps, like, you know, uh, this is for your peers, your administrative staff, your students. So I think it's very interesting course that you can have here. Uh, USMGI has been amazing work uh, around the NC from the education. So, I think you uh, break in. Yeah, so, you're breaking up again. Okay, am I audible? A bit better. Okay, all right. So this was a small written here. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for keeping it so engaged. So I hope that resources like this, and we'll be very happy if you can share resources that you know uh, um, in the community platform. That would be great. Um, I'm to thank our uh, panelists today. I'm going to uh, draw the phrase that you know. Well, once in you uh, attributed to Kofi Annan, uh, education is peace building by another name. So as we draw this, this is one idea that I'm taking away with me, uh, that the work that we do is around uh, building a more inclusive, uh, sustainable, secure, peaceful and prosperous uh, world for all. So thank you so much for engaging in this thought-provoking uh, this in this thought-provoking discussion and sharing your insights and valuable contributions. Um, like I always share with educators, education leaders, and institutions all working together, we collectively have the power and potential to affect positive transformation in education and to ensure human and planetary flourishing. We genuinely appreciate your efforts, uh, your ideas, suggestions, feedback, all of these are valuable to building the kind of community that we all want to be a part of. So thank you for being uh, engaged uh, throughout the discussion. Um, we may not have been able to answer all questions sufficiently. Uh, if you still have those questions, you can direct them to us. And perhaps we can have this discussion in the community. Um, so now you can proceed to the global networking activity where uh, you'd engage in uh, the lounge or in the speed networking area. So on behalf of the Global Citizen Foundation and all our attendees, I once again extend my deepest, deepest gratitude to both Oluwaso as well as Lisa for taking out the time out of the busy schedules and enriching us with uh, through their unique ideas, insights and experiences. So thank you so much for being part of the Educational Leadership Forum and for everything that you've been doing on transforming education to human and planetary flourishing. So see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and spread love and compassion. Our world needs it more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, amazing panel. Bye. Bye. So now we have ended the discussion. Excuse me.